Welcome to This Is My Architecture. My name is Yazid, and with me is David from LucidChart. David, tell us a little bit about LucidChart. What do you guys do? Yeah, and I'm super excited to be here. Thank you for having me. So Lucid is an online platform for creating diagrams. And we also enable real-time collaboration in those diagrams. So Lucid Chart is a way to create your diagrams, any diagram that you can think of, Venn diagrams, mind maps, infrastructure. Uh, and the real-time collaboration portion of it enables people to use those and create those, modify those at the same time. So no more version files, no more clobbering each other's changes. And uh, we also have some really cool import features like AWS import, which will automatically lay out those diagrams for you in our product. That's cool. Um, so I know that today you're here to share with us your uh, database migration journey. Uh, before we look or before we talk about uh, kind of the end state, I'd like to uh, bring uh, our viewers up to speed and tell us a little bit about your existing state. What, how did you run your database prior to uh, the migration? Yeah, absolutely. So we had a requirement to have a very low latency, right, optimized database cluster. And we were using My, uh, MySQL for that. And another big requirement for us was being able to have very little downtime when switching availability zones so that if we ever need to do database maintenance or something similar, mm -hmm. our users weren't impacted. So what we ended up with was a master master MySQL implementation. And that had some challenges so along with it. On EC2, right? On yeah, on EC2, correct. Yeah. So we were cool. using EC2 with EBS as yeah. the underlying data store. Cool. So what are some of the challenges? I mean, you mentioned that uh, you had to do the master master, uh, EBS volumes. What are, what are some of the other challenges you run into or, or roadblocks that made you really think about the migration? Yeah, so. <laughs> technical or non-technical, you, you can share with the viewers in it, uh, both if you have. Absolutely. So the challenges that we ran into were just the same challenges that you're going to run into anytime you have a complex database implementation. So in addition to our master master implementation to support our running application, we also had to support the rest of the business for business analytics and business intelligence, things that were very read heavy. Um, our application is designed to be write heavy because as users make changes to diagrams, we need to persist those as quickly as possible. But we also needed to be able to gather data about things that were happening in the system, which typically causes quite a bit of load on a database cluster. So to address that, in addition to our master master implementation, we also had multiple slaves that would be used for that Analytics, read capacity. Yeah. The other issue that we ran into is we, for legal purposes and contractual purposes, have to keep backups for an extended period of time. And every time we would initiate a snapshot on a, the underlying EBS volumes, there would be a major performance hit just because in addition to the running application, there was also the snapshot sure. load. Yeah. Um, so, so from there, you uh, decided to uh, you know, migrate to uh, Aurora, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that migration journey? <laughs> how the migration went, how did, how did it even start? Tell us how, how you started the migration, actually. So <coughs> we're a SaaS company. We make an awesome product, and we've spent a lot of effort on it. Any time that we spend building out infrastructure, especially if somebody else has built that infrastructure or has the capability of building it for us, is opportunity lost for me and my team. So we had been looking for a while at different managed database services, including RDS, which is a solid service, but it didn't have the uptime requirements that we required during a failover, meaning if we ever needed to do maintenance on one of the clusters, do an upgrade or something, uh, we didn't feel like it just met our needs. So we had been excited about Aurora for quite a while. And the reason is because they were bragging some pretty outstanding claims, like up to 5x performance increase and zero downtime uh, patches. Uh, and it seemed like from the time that we started watching it, every couple months they were checking more and more boxes of requirements that we had. And it wasn't until they introduced and said that they could do encryption at rest out of the box uh, in Aurora, but also encryption cross region out of the box, meaning I could have a cluster in one region and a cluster in another region, and those could be completely up to date with encryption that Aurora really became a possibility for us. Cool, thank you. So tell us uh, a little bit more on what we have here on the diagram. I mean, I see a couple of uh, EC2 um, instances there, uh, a database and some read replicas. Tell us a little bit how, how are these pieces all coming together and how are you using them? Yeah, absolutely. So Aurora is built from the ground up. It's a MySQL compatible cluster. And one of the other really outstanding claims that they made, which turned out to be true, it's pretty amazing, is that every Aurora instance has at least six disks 
spread across three availability zones. And those are not squares, but they're disks. Okay. Yeah. So what these disks allow an instance to do is uh, for data durability and resilience, the master node, whichever node is acting as the master, will actually send the write to all availability zones. And it requires at least three successful writes before the transaction is considered a success or it rolls back that transaction. Now, the reason that's important to us is it means that if an availability zone is having an issue or even if two availability zones are having an issue, uh, the, the data has to be written to at least three disks or it's not persisted, which means that our application is able to know that a transaction either, either needs to be retried or we can mark it as a failure. But it also means that we're never going to run into the risk of losing data or having corrupt data due to a single failed volume right on a single EBS volume. So tell me uh, why you have three availability zones. I see three availability zones here. Yeah. Great question. So our application is stateless, and we have adopted Amazon's suggested practices of having our instances or our uh, application run in multiple availability zones for availability purposes. So occasionally, um, an availability will zone will have issues, uh, and that could be due to Amazon. That could be due to a configuration change or an infrastructure change on our side. But it allows us to do maintenance, or it allows Amazon to do maintenance without impacting our running application. Cool. Um, tell me a little bit more about um, encryption. You mentioned encryp encryption earlier as being part of uh, an important part of your uh, guys' uh, infrastructure and how important to have uh, both your master and uh, slave encrypted at the same time. So how are you doing that with, uh, with Aurora? Uh, can you share that with me and tell me a little Absolutely. bit more? Absolutely. So out of the box is really the answer. So Aurora uh, allows you to encrypt your cluster. Uh, it's as simple as when you create the cluster, you say, I want it to be encrypted, and you select the encryption key, which is stored in uh, Amazon KMS. But we did that for our cluster. So the journey that we took to get there was we had our own master-master database cluster, and we wanted to move to Aurora. We were maintaining our own encryption. And again, as soon as Aurora came out and said that they supported out-of-the-box yeah. encryption, uh, we decided that it was time to actually give it a real trial and make sure that it would actually meet our needs, but in, in the end, we decided to move to it. So what we did is we stood up our first instance, which was just standalone, and the way that we did that is we just exported the data from our database, imported it into the Aurora cluster, and the first thing that we noticed was that the import was about three times faster than what we could do on our own cluster even with all of the tuning and optimizations that we had put in. So that validated the, the first claim that Aurora can be up to five times faster than uh, out-of-the-box implementation. The very next thing that we did once we imported that data was we wanted to test the multi-availability zone capabilities of Aurora. So I went into Amazon, I right-clicked on my instance, and I said, spin up a second instance in this availability zone. And a process that usually took about 24 hours, because this was one of our larger database instances, uh, only took two hours to create that slave in the second availability zone. Cool. Um, another thing, when we talk about database in general, there's uh, one element that seems to be very important, which is performance. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit more about what uh, type of performance did Aurora you know, provide to you versus what you were running prior in uh, basically EC2, MySQL on EC2? Yeah, so performance is a big benefit uh, that we found moving to Aurora. So our writes are roughly the same speed uh, on our own instance versus Aurora, but the read capabilities that Aurora provides uh, gave us far better for performance. So that happened for a couple of different reasons. One, Aurora is very optimized for parallel queries. Uh, our SQL instances were only as optimized as the number of instances that we could stand up. Uh, due to the underlying disk architecture of Aurora, you just get better throughput for the, the queries that are coming into the system. Now, the second piece that Aurora really helps with is that when you stand up an Aurora cluster, it gives you two different endpoints that you can connect to. There's a read-write endpoint, but there's also a read-only uh, read endpoint. Is that something you can illustrate for, for the users? How does that work? Yeah. Absolutely. So if these instances on the left are the read-write read instances, they simply connect to the read-write endpoint, which okay. connects them to the master node. Mm -hmm. 
these instances on the right could be your BI instances. They could even be some of these connections that are part of the application that don't need write capabilities. Right. But there's a second endpoint that they can connect to. And that endpoint, I'm going to draw it right here because you don't actually know where it goes. Aurora under the covers will map those and steer them dynamically to the instances in the cluster that are acting as the read instances. And today, that might be these two instances. Tomorrow, this one might be a read instance, and that one might be a write instance. But with the read-only endpoint, you don't have to worry about that. It steers them to the on right. its own. Oh, that's cool. So you have an endpoint instead of an IP address, and you don't have to worry about where that inst the read instance is. That's correct. That's cool. Um, uh, what, what other benefits were you able to realize from, uh, from this migration? Obviously, I, I kind of got the, the undifferentiated, he undifferentiated heavy lifting. Uh, I, I also uh, got the, uh, the performance benefit, the, the uh, read uh, ability that it gives you multi-AZ, uh, the encryption. What other benefits were you able to realize from, uh, from the migration? Yeah, so there's two major benefits that we were able to uh, Realize. That really excited yeah. us mm -hmm. about the migration. The first is Aurora truly is a SQL compatible, built from the ground up uh, service. And in our environment, we were running master master replication, which means that we were able to do those failovers in our environment uh, without taking downtime. Aurora also supports being a master to an existing uh, SQL cluster, as well as being a slave to an existing SQL cluster. So with those capabilities, the migration path became very simple. We simply took our Aurora cluster, made it a slave to our existing cluster. Once that was caught up on replication, we took our masters in our cluster and made them a slave to Aurora. And once that was in place, all we had to do was switch the traffic on our application service from pointing at our cluster to Aurora. And once the connection is established, we simply turned off our, our cluster. Exists, yeah. So we were able to do that with no downtime, zero impact to customers, no loss of data. Uh, it was very, very, very smooth. The second thing is for disaster recovery and business continuity purposes, we have to keep data in multiple regions, not only in availability zones. And with Aurora, that was a very simple task. So before we moved to Aurora, I would have to copy snapshots periodically between our primary region and our secondary yeah. region. But that meant that our snapshots were always out of date by yeah. some period of time. Yeah. With Aurora, I was able to go to the master cluster, and I simply right-clicked again and said, create a replica in a different region. And that didn't only copy the data. It also created a database cluster that is now completely up to date, real time, only delaying by a few milliseconds. Awesome. Thank you for joining me today, David. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And thank you for watching This Is My Architecture.